Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. I'm your lay reader for today's service, Ruling Elder Zach Cosner, uh, on this beautiful Palm Sunday uh, here in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. If you uh, would like to follow along during the service, I encourage you to go find our bulletin, which is uh, found in the description or comment section of this video, either on Facebook or YouTube, or you can find the bulletin on our website at www.centralprespb.com. Uh, I ask that you turn your attention to the announcements. Um, the announcements on the back of the bulletin um, are correct, but uh, there are also other ones that we have added. Um, Again, the Trinity Village uh, style show has been postponed. Uh, we have not yet uh, heard a date for that uh, reschedulement. Um, also, we can, you can follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You look for us at username Central Prez PB. Uh, neighbor to Neighbor will be shifting to a three-day-a-week schedule. They'll be, uh, that will start on Monday, April 6th. Um, if your children are interested in attending summer camp at Ferncliff, they are still uh, currently scheduling um, until they are told otherwise that they will have their summer camps. If you're interested in that, please contact uh, Emily at Ferncliff. Uh, her email address is emily at ferncliff.org. Uh, you can also uh, look for them on Facebook at uh, Ferncliff Camp and Conference Center. Uh, we'll go ahead and get a link up on our Facebook page uh, to them and that information. Uh, lastly, the uh, Senior High Youth Quake, which was scheduled for uh, the weekend of the 17th, 18th, and 19th of this month, has been canceled. Uh, if you're interested, they are doing a stay-at-home virtual youth quake for Saturday, April 18th. Um, you need to go ahead and get uh, registered for that event if you're interested. I do believe it is free. Um, if you uh, are interested in information for that, please uh, check out a post on our Facebook page where we link to all the information uh, and the registration information for that event. Let us worship God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us worship God. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds, and I will remember their sin no more. In faith and penance, let us confess our sins to Almighty God, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. You, O Lord, are God, and you have given us the light, and you have answered our prayer and become our salvation. We join the festal procession and rejoice at the coming of our King. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. We bless and praise you, Lord, from the safety of this place. But we confess we will not go where you are going. We admire you, but hesitate to follow you. We stand at the roadside with hearts like stones. Even they must cry out, but they are heavy with what they know, that when your adversaries gather, we will flee from you. When accusations mount and insults shame you, our shame will be our turning back. Oh, the ways that we betray you. Our times are in your hand, O oh God. Have mercy on us, Lord, and deliver us. Amen. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. At this point in the service, we'll be turning it over to a message recorded by Reverend Tim Reeves.
Our first reading this morning comes from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, beginning with the fifth verse and proceeding through verse 11. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Our second reading comes from the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 11. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem, and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? Have you ever thought about that tidbit of information? Have you ever wondered why Matthew described the city of Jerusalem as being in a state of turmoil? Was the city afraid? Was it expectant? Was it dizzy with excitement? What does it mean to say that the whole city was in turmoil as Jesus rode into town that day? The Greek word that is translated turmoil is normally used to describe storms or earthquakes or apocalyptic events that accompany momentous happenings. But here it isn't the ground that trembles, but rather a city, a city face to face with its Messiah. Yet we don't know and can't say with any certainty what it was that Matthew meant to convey by announcing that the whole city was in turmoil. Perhaps we would have a better understanding if Jesus were to ride through the streets of our city today. There might be those who quake with fear, especially if they fiercely cling to the status quo, because whenever Jesus went somewhere, 
he spoke about and sought to usher in a newness to life, a change in the human condition, and an end to the old ways of sin and death. There might be some with great expectations who live their lives on the bottom, who find themselves looked over or left behind or simply left out because wherever Jesus went, he had a way of including these very people and giving them love and dignity, which they oftentimes had never known before. There might be those who are excited, especially those who have longed for a better day or a better life where all the wrongs are suddenly righted and everyone gets what he or she has coming. Because wherever Jesus went, he enacted God's justice and righteousness as he exhibited the reign of God. But I wonder if even this would be enough to put our nation in a state of turmoil today if Jesus were to come riding through any of our streets. Because though there is much about our Lord's presence which is earth-shaking and ground-breaking, I'm not necessarily sure that's what Matthew had in mind. Because if that were the case, wouldn't it have made sense to tell us that everywhere Jesus went was cast into a similar state of turmoil? I believe something more must have been involved, and I believe that that something more was the power of memory. Remember, this wasn't just any city into which Jesus rode on that day. It was Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. And Jerusalem still evoked powerful memories which helped to shape people's hopes for the future. Jerusalem had been the center of King David and King Solomon's uh, kingdoms where they ruled over all of their neighbor, neighbors in a time when Israel itself experienced unprecedented freedom, peace, and prosperity, and which, if only for a brief time in the course of human history, was nevertheless the envy of all other kingdoms. There were memories of this once great kingdom being divided into two kingdoms after Solomon died. There were memories of good and bad kings, evil and righteous rulers, men like Hezekiah and Josiah who had cleansed the temple and sought to reform the people and kept Israel's enemies at bay. There were also memories of disaster and exile and shame and destruction, followed by the hopes of returning to rebuild the city and the temple. And then there were also the memories of what had happened just a couple of centuries before Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day. A small, devoted band of faithful Jews led by Judas Maccabeus had recaptured Jerusalem and the temple after the Syrians had desecrated it. Judas Maccabeus and his followers entered the city waving palm branches and celebrated the divine victory over their hated enemy. Then they cleansed the temple so that it might again be a place to mark God's holy presence. Such were the collective memories of the people which had sustained and shaped them for generations. And somewhere along the way, those memories gave birth to a hope that one day a Messiah, God's anointed one, would come along and bring to fruition the climax of the story, a restoration of the glory days when Jerusalem would again be a great and holy city and all the nations would stream to her and bow down. Add to those memories and those hopes the powerful memories associated with the Jewish celebration of Passover the very celebration that marked Israel's independence and deliverance from Egypt. 
and you would expect Jerusalem to, Jerusalem to be nearing a fevered pitch. Then Jesus arrived riding on a donkey. Why? When pilgrims entering Jerusalem for Passover usually walked into the city, would Jesus ride into the city on a donkey? Matthew tells us it was in order to fulfill a prophecy. Because the prophet Zechariah had in fact prophesied, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew intended for us to see Jesus as the embodiment of the king about which Zechariah had spoken. And perhaps some of those who knew their scriptures well would have sensed something momentous was happening as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day. But something wasn't quite right. Yes, royalty was on the way, but Jesus was a king the likes of which the people had never seen before. It's easy to get caught up in the triumphant and victorious aspects of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in fulfillment of that one verse from Zechariah. It isn't difficult to imagine that the power of memory would have proven too much for some, and that they therefore lay on Jesus' shoulders the expectations of a warrior king. Now the time had come at last to overthrow the empire of Rome. Little wonder then that they asked, who is this? Because the image, though familiar, didn't quite mesh with their expectations. Surely we can all relate to that whenever our expectations of what God will do, or how God will reveal God's self, or when God will act, are not fulfilled exactly as we thought or hoped or demanded they would be. The people seemed to have forgotten the rest of Zechariah's prophecy, just as we often forget that God works according to God's will and not our own. Because Zechariah would go on to say, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So ultimately, Jerusalem is a city confronted with a decision. What will it do with a Messiah who ushers in a reign of peace instead of warfare? What will the city do with a prophet who cares deeply for it as a mother hen cares for her brood? How would it respond? Or if we were to put it another way, would Jerusalem be willing to see what it never expected to see? Could it dare to embrace this humble man riding on a donkey? Would it acknowledge a very different kind of king whose triumph and victory is found not in military conquest, but in submitting completely to the will of God? Ultimately, we know that that proved too much to ask, because in just a few short days, Jesus would be arrested, abandoned by those closest to him, tried and convicted unjustly, and crucified. But before we condemn the people of Jesus' day too harshly, we need to take a long, hard look at ourselves. Because the question they faced then it's still the question we face as a church today. What do we do with a Messiah who ushers in a reign of peace instead of warfare? What do we do with a Messiah who commanded such things as turning the other cheek and loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us? What do we do with a Messiah who commanded us to forgive 70 times 7? What do we, who are so often driven by images of success and self-worth, 
do with a Messiah who emphasized humility and self-sacrifice, meekness and gentleness, not only in our dealings with God, but in our dealings with one another. What do we do with the Messiah who called everyone who would follow him to a higher righteousness, a demanding and difficult discipleship, and a level of commitment that denies oneself and takes up one's cross and follows Jesus every day of our lives? What do we do with the Messiah who tells us that following him is certainly no guarantee against suffering? And that, in fact, if the world hated him, it will hate us as well. What do we do with the Messiah who confronted such hatred, not with more hatred, but with love? Who, even as he was being nailed to the cross, turned toward heaven and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I think what we do is we begin by remembering. Remembering not only what Jesus did, but why he did what he did. Dietrich Bonhoeffer summed it up beautifully when he said, God allows himself to be edged out of the world and onto the cross. And that is the way, the only way in which God can be with us and help us. Only a suffering God can help. So our Lord came humbly and gently for the sake of a sinful and broken world. He preached love and forgiveness for our sake. He called us to a higher righteousness for our sake. He exhibited the reign and will of God for our sake. And then he endured death, even death on a cross, for our sake. And the power of those memories should wash over us at all times, not only filling us with comfort and joy and peace, but also teaching us how we should live our lives. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, exhorted Paul to the Christians in Philippi. They and we were reminded of the nature of the Lord we worship. They and we are to have that same mind. The powerful memories of our Lord's sacrifice and love should be the standard by which we give ourselves to one another. His humility should be the standard by which we live our lives. His self-emptying act and sacrifice should dictate how we give ourselves to God and to others. Because that's how our Lord lived each and every day of his life. When you think about it that way, no wonder the whole city of Jerusalem was in turmoil when he arrived, because they had never seen anyone like that in their collective memories. But what about us? Why do so many in the church of Jesus Christ today remain unshaken by his presence in our midst? Could it be that we have simply forgotten his earth-shaking message of love and humility and his call for us to live likewise? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At now it is the time of the service that we would be um, taking up our tithes and offerings. Um, I will at this time uh, remind everyone that uh, work was uh, started this week to set up our online tithing portal. Um, we, uh, I'm waiting for an email from um, the vendor uh, to set that up. It should be up sometime this week. Um, until then, please feel free to uh, mail your offerings here to the church. Uh, the address for the church is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. And uh, if you need that address again, you can find it on our website at www.centralprespb.com. Uh, we've come to the time in our service for our sharing of our joys and concerns. Um, we have been asked by Rose and Susie Von Tunglin to keep their uncle Marvin Workman and uh, family in prayer. Uh, he is being transferred to an inpatient hospice facility, and he has had several strokes that have, have left him uh, unresponsive. unresponsive. Um, so we will continue to keep Marvin Workman in our prayers. Um, we will also ask uh, that we, uh, of course, uh, keep those recovering from the hurricane, uh, hurricane, excuse me, the tornado in Jonesboro uh, in our prayers, and also the, um, all of the uh, frontline health workers, our first responders, and all of those who are um, essential workers, um, uh, correctional officers, and um, uh, EMTs, and grocery clerks, and uh, those people who are working through this pandemic and um, need our prayers right now. Uh, we ask that you uh, pray for all of those affected uh, and their families uh, by this pandemic. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask that you uh, give healing and comfort to the family of uh, Marvin Workman, uh, that you be with all of those who are affected by the tornado in Jonesboro, and be with all of those who are uh, being affected and are currently sick with uh, the coronavirus. Uh, give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, one last thing before we conclude today's service. Uh, Tim has prepared a, a short video for Good Friday. Uh, we encourage you to uh, seek it out and find it this Good Friday. Uh, we will be posting it on our uh, Facebook, our YouTube, and our social media channels. Again, you can find that at Central Prez PB. Uh, go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>